Hey guys, thanks a lot for watching the first episode of Grit last week. Our entire team worked their butts off on this series, so we really appreciate you checking it out. After each Grit episode, we're going to do a hunt recap video, and we're going to share some of the behind the scenes stuff. We'll talk about strategy, share what worked for us, and most importantly, what didn't work for us. These videos aren't meant to lecture you on how to hunt, but there are ways of sharing our observations with you. We are fortunate that we get to hunt as much as we do, but it wasn't always this way. And in the past, we learned from other great hunters out there uh, that were generous enough to share their experiences. So this is our simple way of trying to contribute to that conversation. At the very least, we're hoping you can learn from some of our mistakes, and that's where we're going to start this video. Anytime you hear about hunting ag or open country, you hear a lot about glassing. And this was our initial plan heading out there. We thought, hey, let's try to get some eyes on something and then we can come up with a plan from there. Anytime we hunt a new area, our first priority is just to find some concentration of deer. So we got out there a couple days early and started glassing in the mornings and evenings, but it didn't take long for us to realize that this was going to be challenging. In this area, there was endless standing corn, standing corn for miles, and the beans were way taller than we're used to back home. So the standing ag made it tough to see, but the terrain was also a lot hillier than we expected, which eliminated our line of sight to a lot of those low spots you would expect to see bucks feeding. After we realized glassing wasn't going to be efficient, we knew we had to move on to plan B and cover some ground on foot. We thought, okay, let's at least try to find some good sign, uh, a fresh track, and work back from there. This plan quickly proved to be more difficult than expected because the ground was so dang dry. You couldn't tell, they were just circles. And I was yeah. like, is that sign? And then I stuck my fingers in and it just crumples. Yeah. Most of the tracks looked like the point of impact from a golf ball in a sand trap, so it was hard to judge the true size of the track. So it was on to plan C and we decided to start looking at food sources, trying to find signs of feeding. And this was our first indication of deer density. Now we needed to figure out bedding and we knew we needed to have a good water source in the area and water really ended up being the key variable on this trip. I know this probably seems obvious to a lot of you, but being from Michigan, we really underestimated the importance of water. So as an attempt to figure out bedding, we decided to do an observation sit. We got a couple good bucks on camera at this spot, but they were nighttime pictures, so we weren't exactly sure where the deer were coming from. Now, this observation sit taught us something that ended up being extremely important. The first buck we saw that night popped up in the lowest spot in the entire field. We also had a doe come out of the corn and work up the edge of the field. And then later in the evening, we had a deer drop off of this point in the corn, move into the wind and scent check the area just like they would do in hill country. We had a trail cam pick of a buck going into the corn that morning, so we made the assumption that this was him or another buck. After this observation sit and based on trail cam data and the limited sign we saw while scouting, we felt like we understood how the deer were bedding, but we still didn't fully understand where the deer were going right out of bed. So I can see if these deer are moving off this point over here. There's a point that juts out into the corn. This is around this corn over there and corn over here. And then that water hole is down over there, I think on a south wind. They're going to move this way. We saw all those trails in that field. So I think they're going to come up off that point. And this will confirm it for us. Were they prioritizing food or were they prioritizing water? And on that next sit, we got our first opportunity at a buck. As you saw in the episode last week, I really screwed this up and didn't stop the deer, but this hunt taught us something important. Before that buck came out, there were a couple does that moved through. And it was interesting to us because the does hopped the fence and moved right past the bean field down the cedar ditch. At the bottom of this ditch was a pond, and that's when we realized the deer were hitting water before they were moving out to food. This ended up playing a major role in our setup on the following evening when we killed that buck. I think we gotta go out and around. Get on that side. I think they're gonna come right through this. And the setup was very simple based on the observations we saw the previous few days. So we're hoping that there's deer movement doing the same thing that buck was doing last night. 
deer were moving from bedding that set up just like it does in hill country and moving to water before they hit food. Or we assume they could be bedded on the water as well, and this is exactly what happened on this final hunt. We chose to hunt this spot because there was an elevated ag field that dropped down to a low area that went back up to a pond that was surrounded by thick security cover. We figured if we sat in between the two, we had a good chance of something moving through. And fortunately, luck was in our favor that night, and, and this is exactly what the buck did. He was bedded up on the water, got up towards the end of the evening, and literally ran down to the low spot to browse and scent check the area. So as one final note, we also learned something important about the deer's tolerance for human activity. On both of the hunts, we had opportunities at Bucks. The farmers were out there working in the fields all day. We usually shy away from human activity, but in this case, it didn't matter and actually probably helped us because they were used to seeing, hearing, and smelling humans. All right, so I know that that was a a lot of information in a short amount of time so let's quickly summarize what we observed on this trip first what didn't work for us glassing was tough because of the standing corn and sign was tough to see because it was so dry out there in the future we'll probably go straight to boots on the ground and look for good browsing sign on food sources as for key learnings on this trip there were a few that ended up being crucial number one hill country bedding in the ag Deer were using hilly terrain features just like they do in traditional hill country areas. Most of the bedding we observed was in the ag or on the edge of the ag. Number two, deer were prioritizing water over food. It was in the upper 90s every day we were out there, so this should have been obvious to us, but deer want water after being bedded all day. And finally, number three, the deer in the area tolerated human activity. There were farmers working in the fields every day we were out there, so this makes sense. The deer were used to seeing, smelling, and hearing humans. So that sums up the first hunt recap of the year. Thanks a lot for watching. Hopefully you can use some of our observations to help you avoid some of the mistakes we made and, and figure things out a little quicker than we did. If you guys have any questions or comments on this stuff, uh, leave a comment on the video and we'll, we'll get back to you guys as quickly as possible. Uh, feel free to leave some feedback too if you have any thoughts on how we can make these videos better. We love hearing from you guys and we want these videos to be the best that they possibly can be. Uh, so don't be shy and tell us how we can improve. Anyway, thanks again for watching. We really appreciate it and uh, good luck this season.